So let's take a look at the topography as the plane uh, approached. The, this is the area that's underneath the uh, the plane path. Uh, the top part is from a Delorme uh, Topo USA uh, going uh, across the, the path that uh, we've, we've talked about. And you can see kind of what the altitude is of the, uh, of the terrain. If we put the obstacles on there, we have the the Sheridan on the left hand side. We have the V dot tower. We've got the Navy Annex. We've got uh, the location that's about the Sitco station. We've got the lamppost number um, one, and then we've got the generator trailer and the and the impact uh, area of the uh, at, at the Pentagon. If we draw it to scale so that the vertical and horizontal are about the same, this is what we would get. G-forces. Pilots for 9-11 Truth calculate G-forces. Many people have used their assertion that these forces are too high to rule out a large plane impact just because the pilots have said that. So we're going to take a look at what they actually said. So the Pilots for 9-11 Truth use a simple equation for centripetal force to estimate the G-forces. It's applied to the aircraft descending from the V-dot tower, from the top of the V-dot tower. It's a straight linear descent from above the V-dot tower to, the, to an arc where there's a transition to level as it passes street lamp post number one and remains level to the west facade of the Pentagon. The pilots for 9-11 Truth calculate a total of 10.14 G-force during this transition. The claim is that the G-forces are too high for a Boeing 757 and it purports to rule out a large plane impact. We'll take a closer look at this. The formula that they use for centripetal force or centripetal acceleration is pretty simple, pretty standard. It's the centripetal acceleration A equals V squared over R. The way that they set up the problem is shown here. This is from their video. We have the Pentagon on the right. We have the plane coming in from the left. We have an arc that has a radius of 2,085 feet. And so the plane is going to be coming in from the left, swinging around, coming level, and hitting the Pentagon building. That's the way that they've set up the problem. When you actually do the calculations, it's uh, the plane's going, estimated here by them, 781 feet per second. We square that to get V squared. We divide by 285 feet, the radius. We div then divide by 32 feet per second squared, which is uh, the acceleration of gravity, and we end up with 9.14 Gs. And then we add one for Earth's gravity, and we get the 10.14. So here's our more complete problem diagram that's got it pretty much drawn to scale. So we have the plane starting from the left at the V dot tower, coming to the arc where it has to make the transition, and then going to the Pentagon wall on the right hand side. It's a straight line from V dot to the arc. It's a straight line from the uh, towards the Pentagon building, and only in within the the angle there do we see, have any centripetal acceleration? And the centripetal acceleration is only applied for 194 feet. We have 1g to the left of the arc. We have 1g to the right of the arc. We have 10.14 within the arc. So it's a kind of a big difference there. And so we're going to talk about uh, what has to happen in order for the plane to actually begin making this transition. So the mechanics of the pull-up is that the uh, elevators have to be commanded by the pilot or the piloting system. The control system then begins to move the elevator. As the elevator begins to move, upward uh, air pressure from the forward motion pushes the tail down. As the tail goes down, the angle of attack of the main wing increases. With the increased angle of attack, the wings create more lift from the downwash, and the, as the plane moves forward, it goes up relative to the tail now. The plane obtains some angular momentum that must be counteracted, and I mention that because this is a very fast, large change in orientation in a very short distance, in a short time. Once the arc 
once you start entering into the ark to level out, you have to undo all that. So you have to have the elevators have to be commanded to go in the opposite direction. The control system begins to move the elevators from where they were to create this movement to go back to where they were. As the elevator begins to move downward, air pressure from the forward motion will push the tail up. The angle of attack of the main wing will decrease. With decreased angle of attack, the wings create less lift from the downwash as the plane moves forward again. And then to obtain the level of flight, the angular momentum must be counteracted and then you're level. What we're going to see here is a sample of just how long you're going to be in that particular time period. What we have is when it's white, we're at about 1G. We're at 1G. And when you see the black, that is the time when the 10.14G applies. And in order to do that, all this stuff has to happen. All that we just went through about the, the plane, the angle of attack, the elevators doing things, and the control system, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so that's the length of time that you have for all that to happen in order for this 10.14 g-force to, uh, to be to apply. So right now it's 1g, 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 10g. 1g, 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 1g. That, that's it. So not very much time for all that stuff to have happened in the meantime. The pilot's final element truth calculated g-force was done in a transition that was only 194 feet or only 1.1 plane lengths. Kind of a short distance to get all that air motion across the wings in order to do all the forces on the elevator and the, all, all that other stuff. Um, but the, the calculated g-force results in uh, the 10.14g and the g-force is applied for only a quarter of a second. Their assumed control system response seems a little fast there are so many mechanical operations that have to go on and dependencies between the mechanical systems, the movements, the airspeed, the wind, and all the plane has to be moving forward in order for the control system to have any effect at all. So it seems like the, they miss something about how the real plane would actually work. The following slide shows a continuous arc over a longer distance instead of using 2,085 feet radius and applying it only for that uh, short time period. Uh, what we have here is an example of a 16,300 foot arc radius that creates an upward g force of 1.16 g. That would be within the structural limits of a 757 and is actually consistent with the information that's in the flight data recorder. The approach path conclusions. The flight path developed from the F, from the radar and FDR tracks to the Pentagon are consistent with observed data. They're consistent with the trapezio's location at 1400 South Barton, the shadow in the Sitco uh, security camera uh, that makes it co that's consistent with that. The tree notch confirms the location of the right engine for the most part. Looking at the lamppost, the severed lamppost number one because it's broken into three part means that it was impacted by a very significant piece of the wing, if not even the right engine cowling. The bent lamp post number two verifies the extremity of the of the uh, left wing. It can't be any further over or it would have severed the, the pole. Or if it was uh, a little further over to the, to the right, it would not have even hit it. So it kind of gives you a really good feel for where that is. And then, of course, near the facade, we've got the impacted diesel generator trailer that provides the location of the right engine, and the impacted retaining wall indicates the location of the left engine. So now we're going to talk about the approaching uh, plane near the Pentagon, right up close in, to the facade and uh, very near to the uh, terminus. We have our table of contents. If you want to jump to another section, feel free to. Go to the slide numbers shown on the right. And this is for chapters 9 through 17. Again, here's the west wall before the uh, of the Pentagon before 9-11. The tree in front of column 16 is shown, and you've got the wire spools. I've highlighted those. We see the retaining wall that I've highlighted the circle where that's going to be impacted and the diesel generator trailer, uh, which we will be talking about. The plane superimposed above the lawn um, 
is shown here. The there have been some adjustments made for perspective here, uh, and you can see the right engine is hitting the trailer. The left engine is in the location to impact the retaining wall. The nose is hitting about column 14. So this is, uh, from a perspective point of view, about where you would be looking at things to happen. We'll be doing this mostly from a top view in the later slide. So the dimensions that are relative to the approaching aircraft, uh, first the diesel generator trailer is highlighted. It's about 80 feet from the wall. It's about 450 feet uh, of the area where you have the row AA of the uh, columns uh, where the facade juts out a little bit. The angle is, uh, of approaching is uh, 52 degrees, um, 50, 52 degrees, something like that. We've got 52 shown here. The impacting, impacted retaining wall uh, is highlighted uh, in, in the red. Column 14 is highlighted in the red. Um, we here have added the C-ring exit hole, which is where the plane uh, parts of the, the heavier parts of the plane will travel through. So in this sequence here, what we see is the the plane is uh, is approaching. Uh, it would have hit the impact of the diesel generator. It would have used a lot of energy to move this multi-ton uh, generator trailer. And by impacting on just one side, it's going to begin the rotation of the of the plane as it travels. Because uh, now the, the left, the right side is moving at a slower speed than the left side. So the left engine will then impact the retaining wall. It's not much of a, an impact, uh, just uh, breaking up a little bit of concrete. This is the retaining wall gouge, and uh, again, it's taken about perpendicular to column uh, 14. The trailer impact uh, is a basis for the yaw rotation of the plane as it's as it's uh, kind of going in a little uh, crooked now. As, a pro, as the approaching plane um, comes near the Pentagon, it has a, a weight of about 100 tons. It's uh, traveling symmetric around the line, of, the line of travel. The engines are about 21 feet to either side of the center line. The generator trailer has a weight that is about in the range of 20 to 40 tons. 80,000 tons is, or 80,000 pounds is a pretty typical limit for uh, over-the-road vehicles. Uh, probably had 20% of the, it was probably about 20% of the plane mass. From the uh, principle of conservation of momentum, upon impact with the generator trailer, there's a significant force exerted on the trailer. It causes the trailer to accelerate towards the Pentagon wall, uh, where it rotates and moves forward about 15 feet. That same force is applied to the plane and tends to push back on the plane on that side, uh, creating a rotational uh, force. The plane transmits the energy to the trailer, creating the rotational force to the plane, as shown. Rotation of the plane around the center of mass continues, and uh, in the remaining 80 or so feet, won't be able to uh, change very much, but, it, but the rotation uh, does appear to continue. We'll talk about that. The impact sequence. Within about 100 feet of the Pentagon, the plane impacts the diesel generator trailer. It impacts the wire spools impacts the retaining wall. The right engine impacting the diesel generator causes the plane to rotate. The trailer physically is moved, which absorbs energy from the right side of the plane's momentum. The plane is rotated slightly and impacts the facade. The right wing impacts the second floor uh, columns 18 to 20. Column 18 is bashed in and tilts southward. Column 19 is bashed in at least a foot. Column 20 exhibits limestone damage. No identifiable plane debris is observed on the shelf between column 19 and 20. And deep damage to the second floor slab right at column, um, right at column 18 suggests a pivot point for the, ring, uh, uh, for the wing. The rightmost 20 feet of the wing is relatively light compared to the structure um, up to the generator or up to the, the engine. 
The right, impa right engine impacts between columns 16 and 17, approximately halfway between the first and second floor slabs, the ground floor slab and the second floor slab. Approximately horizontal, there wouldn't be a, much of a seismic event because it's hitting uh, columns to the side. The left inje engine would impact uh, into column 12, close to the first floor slab, approximately horizontal, again, no seismic event. The plane uh, impacts the facade. The left wing impacts the middle of the first floor with column 9AA as the last impacted column on the north side. As the plane impacts the building, the left wing impacts and destroys columns 13 through 10. The forward momentum of the plane is dissipated. Speed is reduced significantly. Don't know how much, but uh, by doing this damage to the Pentagon wall, it has to have been slowed down some. Column 9A -A and the steel tube window support adjacent to it are not destroyed by the decelerated mass and the relatively lightweight end of the wing, the last 20 feet or so. Talking about the facade, the severed tree stump at column 16 provides the height of the wing in the fuselage. The bulk of the plane's mass is in the lower third of the airframe structure. The left wing impacts entirely below the second floor slab. Damage to the second floor slab between columns 11 and 12 is attributable to the tail rudder section. Um, this is a photo of a cutaway of a plane, a large passenger plane. This is a, an A300 in the center showing the, the structural support, the luggage area below, and uh, where the wings are. It, off on the left-hand side, you can see an equivalent for a Boeing 757, uh, which has the two seats identified. Here you've got uh, most of the mass and the structures below the, the passenger floor. That's where people are walking. That's where all the supports have to be. The outer shell has to just support all the... Uh, uh, the, the luggage racks and make sure that there's enough structure so <laughs> everything holds together. But most of the mass is in the lower part of the uh, the plane, and that's where most of the damage was, or most of the mass was, and that's where most of the damage was done. Oh, so before hitting the generator trailer, uh, we have this uh, picture. Now we're going to start moving it uh, a little bit closer towards the wall. Um, it, it, hits the, it hits it and begins to have some generation yaw rotation begin before hitting the retaining wall. The, the ro rotation continues. The left engine impacts the retaining wall. The right engine clears the generator trailer. The wingtip doesn't hit the ground. There's no signs of it having hit the ground, but the engine has stopped it from hitting, from rotating down any further and sets the lowest point that the, the lowest angle that the wing can have. Uh, the plane continues towards the facade, probably accelerating spools four and seven. Uh, continues towards the facade. Nose hits at column 14. Continues impacting the facade. Right engine impacts the window to the left of column 17. Right wing spar bashes in the second floor columns uh, 18 and 19. Left engine impacts column 12. Left wing impacts column 9 AA. It's not nine, column 9 AA is bowed, not severed, uh, because of the energy uh, that was expended. The bulk of the planes inside the gun. Tail impacts near column 12. And so uh, I'm going to go through that again in a little more, a little different sequence here, perspective. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about the columns in particular here. So what we have is the, the plane approaching. I've highlighted the tree in front of column 16. We'll be seeing that move as the, the plane uh, comes in, as it gets slammed up against the wall, and then has to continue moving uh, southward or northward. Here's the plane moving in. Some more, some more, some more. It starts to have some rotation. 
And as we see the nose hit about column 14, we see things continue. We see the engine impacting uh, columns uh, near column 17. We see the plane approaching column 21. It's got some rotation. So the right wing impacts uh, at the intersection of column 18 and the second floor slab and impacting wing mass can bash or break the columns, but it can't move the floor slab. It, the floor slab is just too big. The heavy end of the wing then begins to pivot around column uh, 18 floor slab point as the engine and heavy side of the wing pivot around column 18. The forces around the fulcrum of the pivot then push column 18 southward at, into the angle that's, that's observed. So now we also have to talk about the tree that had been in front of column 16 that has now been severed and is now hitting the facade of the Pentagon from probably from the, the ground floor, halfway up the ground floor to about the third floor. This is going to create a lot of mechanical stress as it hits the building, rebounds, and probably is breaking up some of the structure and is going to lead to the two window sections from column 15 to column 14 and column 14 to column 13 to break away and fall away, thus creating the 16-foot hole that so many people have talked about. And now you can see I've moved the tree at column 16. is now traveling through the plane. Uh, column 21 is not impacted, uh, shown because it's just outside the reach, but column 20, which does have the limestone knocked off it, uh, is clearly impacted by this light end of the, the wing. And we're about ready to have the left engine impact about column 14, I mean uh, column 12. There it is. There it is. The tree is accelerating towards the north. And here what we have is that the seal window frame and column 9AA only need to arrest the last 20 feet of the wing, the lightest part, after significant deceleration. Deceleration results from converting the kinetic energy to perform the work of destruction. Um, then it continues. The tail impacts between column 11 and 12. There. So the pivot of the pivoting the, the right wing tip and the resulting tilt of column 18. Here we're looking at the, the right wing uh, and we're looking at a pivot around the uh, area of column 18 and the floor slab. We're showing it impacting. We're showing the that as it rotates there there are forces uh, on the wing to kind of push it to the right, uh, but those forces also are on the column, which is pushing the column to the left or to the south. Um, it uses this point as the fulcrum, and then uh, as the wing is uh, pushed in more, the, the column 18, which was bashed in with the connections to the slab, uh, significantly damaged, are now is now pushed slightly to the south. Now if we take a look at the left wing as it begins to impact the window frame post adjacent to the column 9AA uh, which shelters it and column 9AA. Uh, the left wing begins to impact the, the window frame post and column 9A. The left wing solidly impacts it. Now what I've shown here where the kind of the darker um, lines are the structure of the wing. So the front leading spar is I'm showing as, as being damaged uh, and deformed, um, but the rear support is not damaged. It's still kind of holding everything, would, would tend to hold everything together. Um, and this light end can't sever the column. It doesn't have enough energy to, to do it, and that's evidenced by the steel frame still being in existence, as well as the column 9AA being bowed but not severed. And uh, the left wing doesn't sever the columns uh, and the f fingers on the window frame grab the 
are, are grabbed as the plane mass is going through and that also helps to rotate the frame so that the fingers are now uh, 90 degrees or 120 degrees uh, away from their original orientation which was pointing out towards the uh, Washington Boulevard. So we have not column 9 AA and the adjacent uh, steel window frame uh, that was resisting the wing. The wing. These window support fingers were oriented outward uh, towards um, the road alongside the window. And after the impact, they rotated 120 degrees or at a minimum 90 degrees, but 120 looks about right. The, the left wing would have uh, caught on some of those fingers and it can explain some of that rotation as it's pushing the, as, as the material is, is caught and uh, pushing on just one side. Column 9AA is, uh, again, also shown to be rotated more at the height of the wing impact than down below. So it seems like a reasonable uh, estimation for what actually happened. This is a, a picture of the area just to the right of where column 9AA is and the uh, steel window frame. We can see column 10A. It's uh, hanging uh, from... The, the top and it's lean, leaned in. The concrete's been stripped off the lower half. Uh, just a, an indication of some of the other forces that are going on in this particular area. And Son Boger, who was in the control tower, describes a plane entry, wings and all, into the Pentagon. He says, uh, I just see like the nose and the wing of an aircraft just like coming right at us and he didn't veer. And you just heard the noise and then he just smacked into the building, and when it hit the building, I'm watching the plane go all the way into the building. So once it went into the building, it exploded, and once it exploded, I hit the floor, and I just covered my head. It was like glass shattering and ceiling tiles uh, was falling in, and that's from his uh, Center for Military um, uh, History. So damage to some of the key locations at the facade are that there's a lot of evidence of a large momentum-based impact consistent with a large plane cannot be explained by other hypotheses either the exterior interior in exterior planet explosives interior explosives or a cruise missile type. this is the again the column 19 uh, bashed in um, uh, portion of the column on the second floor another view of that uh, another view of that and again showing the pivot point for the uh, right wing uh, at the immovable floor slab and column 18. Column 18 is pushed to the south, uh, suggesting that it was used as a fulcrum for the, uh, the rotating wing. Um, there's no um, plane debris that's really visible on the shelf, but there is some limestone uh, as a result of the impact into um, uh, column 20, uh, which is on the left, column 21 has no visible damage. Uh, another picture showing column 21 no damage, column 20 with uh, significant uh, limestone that has uh, fallen away and more debris on, debris on the shelf, but it doesn't look like plain parts. And another uh, aerial view of the same uh, area showing the same kind of uh, damage. And again, column 9 AA is bowed uh, inward at the north end from the wing impact. So I've already described how this is evidence of the light end of the wing being slowly, relatively slowly arrested uh, by the impacting forces, and it's not enough to break or sever uh, the column. The damage near column 12 suggests the impacting mass was into the second floor. Uh, the height of the wing, as we've talked about before, was established by the b bend and bow in column 9 AA, so the wing is about halfway between the first and second floor slabs. The the only thing that could be hitting this area here between tw columns 12 and 13 would be the, the rudder uh, tail section of, of the plane. 
and as we saw from the rotation this is about the location where it would have been impacting let's take a closer look here so what we what we see here is the two window frames the two blast resistant windows you can actually see the fingers of the uh, supports uh, on the one between 12 and column 12 and 13 the brick infill has been knocked loose in this area, suggesting that there was a significant uh, impact into this area. The beam that goes across the front is also missing, suggesting that the that has been impacted, fallen away, and maybe even dragged down into the uh, into the opening by the impacting uh, uh, tail section. So this provides a lot of detail related to the area where it appears that the the tail in the rudder section would have impacted. The next thing we're going to do is take a look at the plane projected onto the uh, damage on, at the facade. The key assumptions for the plane projection are that the impact area was scaled to 140 feet. From wingtip to wingtip the wingspan is 124 feet but because it's coming in at a different angle it has to be made a bit larger. Without rotation, the projection would be 157 feet. But because we assume that the engine hit the the right engine hit the generator trailer, began some rotation. Also, there was a little, probably a little additional uh, rotation caused by the right wing impacting the wall. Um, the rotation has no significant impact on the direction of the momentum, just the orientation of the plane. And uh, I've assumed that both wings flexed up uh, about four feet at the wingtips. The impact angle is about four degrees to the horizontal. What we show here is the west facade area showing the impact area. We've seen this picture before. And now what I've done is I've superimposed a plane with these adjustments to it so that what we have is the plane impacting above the second floor slab at about uh, column uh, 19 in line with the where the Column 19 was bashed in. We show column uh, 20 getting uh, hit where the limestone is going to fall away. Column 21 is just uh, barely missed. The On the right-hand side, we have the engine impacting at, into column 12. And the orientation of the wing is at the right angle to push in column 9AA and the steel frame post next to it. And the height is established by the, on the right side by the uh, uh, height of the shattered tree stump. So this is consistent with all the damage to the wall and the tree stump. If we take a closer look here on the right hand side, we can see that I've, where I've placed the, the wing is right about where the column 19 is bashed in it's rotating around the the right wing is rotating around the uh, intersection of column 18 and the second floor slab the right wing or the left wing is at the point where the column 9 AA is bashed in or bent the most uh, and of course you can see the the steel window frame next to it and we've got the shattered tree stump just uh, showing the uh, uh, correct height for uh, being severed by the leading wing spur. Now what we're going to see is a trace of the right and the left engines. This is the right engine. The right engine is going to be traveling towards the wall. It's going to impact the diesel generator trailer and it's either going to bounce up a little bit or what's going to happen is it's because the entire plane is descending and it hits this, it's not going to be able to go down. The rest of the plane is going to have to go down a little bit. And the left engine is going to then compensate. It's going to have to go down because the right wing is either not going down or it's gone up a little bit. Uh, but we'll see that in the, next, in the next slide. Here's the left engine. And what you're going to see is that as the left engine is traveling towards the impact point at about column 12 it's going to get pushed down it at about where the retaining wall is he's going to it's going to hit there probably has a significant downward velocity as it's rocked down hits the ground and may bounce up a little bit 
but in the meantime, it's left the mark, and it also prevents the um, left rest of the wing tip from uh, actually approaching and touching the ground. And so after it bounces a little bit, it's going to uh, continue on and impact column 12, approximately level. And what we have here is a, the two of them outlined together, kind of trying to show the little jig that they're doing as the plane is approaching the, the wall and it is rotating around the angle of um, uh, the, the axis of rotation as it's approaching the wall. Now we're going to take a look at the wire spool. The presence of the wire spools has been cited as evidence against a large plane impact. Post-impact photos show them in the path of uh, the plane. However, their initial location was not previously known. Now sufficient pre-impact photos are available to identify where they were in advance of the plane impact. Uh, five, of the, five of the spools are seen in the post-impact photos. I'm assuming that the uh, spools five and six are probably labeled correctly. Spools three, four, and seven are, are best guesses which ones are which. Um, the west wall. This is the west wall of the Pentagon before 9/11. Uh, you can showing the the spools in the yellow box. We'll zoom in those. This is the wire spools. I'll be labeling, uh, referring to them as label as uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We can see these from the aerial photographs that uh, from September 7th. Uh, you can see that they're they are located here. I've identified them. Uh, from this, from the previous photo with the same numbering system and shown them here. So they're all uh, identified. Uh, and afterwards, after the uh, the impact, five of the seven are seen. We don't know what happened to the two. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that one and two are, are missing. Don't know which ones they actually are, but... Uh, that's what the uh, that's what we're 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 able to see here. Uh, here we're able to see uh, three, four, five, six, and uh, seven. Uh, we have the three spools that were knocked towards the wall. Uh, we can see them uh, here, and we have five and six that seem to be about where they uh, were originally stored. Three spools uh, that were knocked towards the wall. Here's another uh, picture of them. The fifth spool is observed is obscured by the smoke, uh, so we have them here. Um, in chapter nine, we're going to uh, take a look at Lloyd's taxi cab, uh, treating it as an accident scene, and seeing what we can find. We have our table of contents. If you want to jump to another section, feel free to go to the slide numbers shown on the right. And this is for chapters 9 through 17. So, in reviewing Lloyd's uh, taxi cab incident, uh, when treated as an accident scene using the physics of motions, the location of the taxi and the debris supports Lloyd's survivor fund statement. The location of the debris uh, from the light pole number one and number two is documented in the photographic record. A location of the debris from light pole number one and two is consistent with a high speed impact at a point below the attachment point of the lamp support arms. Lloyd's uh, survivor fund statement, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but he began his morning uh, on September 11th, uh, like most days, driving his taxi cab. As he approached the Navy Annex, uh, he saw a plane flying dangerously low overhead. Simultaneously, a plane struck a light pole, and the pole came crashing down onto the front of Lloyd's taxi cab, destroying the windshield in front of his eyes. Uh, glass was everywhere. He tried to stop the car. Another car stopped, um, and the driver helped him move the heavy pole off of Lloyd's car. As they were moving the pole, they heard a big boom and turned to see an explosion. The light pole fell on Lloyd, and he struggled to get up from underneath, wondering what had happened. So uh, here's the windshield, and the rear seat um, were damaged by the light pole. The imprecise use of the word pole has opened the door to confusion. The street lamp has um, three pole segments. There's the mast and the two lamp support arms. This photo here uh, shows you the mast. Uh, there's a lower uh, arm 
pole, there's a lamp, and there's an upper arm pole, lamp support arm poles. And the lamp uh, is just separated, it will separate in many of the cases separately from the, the poles. It just kind of breaks away. In the rear seat of the taxi cab, there are some small holes uh, consistent with um, a lower support arm having been the impinging uh, item. Here's another photo. These were taken by the citizens investigation team when they went out there. And um, Lloyd himself drew a picture of the uh, taxi cab and what he shows here is the doodle at the top um, with uh, some detail. Uh, he shows that it's uh, small sticking out to about as far as uh, uh, the front hood, if not maybe a little further. The He's got a little knob on the front, which would be consistent with the curl of the, or, or the attachment point um, between the upper and lower uh, lamp support arms. We'll talk about that. Depiction by another person showing the entire mass through the windshield, because a lot of people have caricatured this uh, incident and suggested that it was an entire lamp post that was uh, through, the the, through the cab. Um, but that doesn't make any sense uh, from the, the damage or any mechanics uh, that I can envision. Um, there's also uh, corro some corroboration of the event, uh, the explosion that uh, Lloyd talks about, because about four to six minutes after the impact, uh, this fireball is uh, seen. It's uh, recorded by Daryl Donnelly, uh, and it's about the time that, uh, for Lloyd to have stopped, um, been stopped. Uh, someone have gotten out, uh, someone else trying to help them get the light pole out, and then... Uh, the lamp support arm out of the, the cab and then for him to then um, witness the explosion gets uh, and drop the, the pole on him and the, of course the term heavy is all relative. So let's take an overview of the accident. Uh, first of all let's uh, identify uh, where some things are. This is from a Google Maps um, street view and we can see light pole number uh, one, uh, we can see the tree. That's uh, this is a 2009 uh, vintage image, and you can see that the notch is still not completely uh, obliterated. So what we have here is light pole number one. It's at the um, the south end of the brick wall of the overpass. On the other side near the north end of the overpass brick wall is light pole number two. This is the one that was uh, knocked down and uh, laying on, the, laying on the, the slope of the ground just uh, after the events. So this is a sh a, uh, showing a kind of a close-up of the uh, impacting area. I've highlighted the, the red dots uh, where uh, light pole number one and light pole number two would be the it looks like the lamp post number one hit the center of the wing spar uh, and because of the second because there there's a five foot piece it's possible that it actually hit front on with the uh, with the engine uh, and uh, was was severed both at the top and the bottom uh, and that piece uh, got knocked uh, uh, separately into the travel lane Limp num uh, post number two was just hit by the wing end and um, was not uh, was not severed. So at the end, the lamp post debris is uh, shown here. If we zoom in on it, what we see is that the mass number two is laying off to the side. It's been uh, bent as if it were whacked, uh, uh, probably uh, 30, uh, 25 to 30 feet up uh, from the side and. Uh, the debris, the uh, the upper arm and lamp two, uh, lamp two was uh, shown uh, in the yellow circle there. At the bottom, we see the uh, mast one pieces, uh, the two major pieces, the very long uh, 25 foot piece and the uh, upper five foot piece are shown there, and the upper and lower. Uh, arm are shown in the uh, the hollowed out uh, 
yellow oval. Reaction time, braking, and stopping distance. At the 40 miles an hour that Lloyd said that he was traveling at, with reaction time, the stopping distance is expected to be about 164 feet. He's traveling about 60 feet per second, so to, more or less uh, the re reaction time at, at 1.5 seconds is 88 feet. The braking distance is 76 feet, and that's how we get the 164-foot uh, estimate. And if you were to place the, uh, go back from where the Lloyd's taxi cab ended up and go back about 160 feet, it would put it in a, in a position to have been uh, impacted uh, uh, and then have a reaction time and then a braking time, braking distance to end up where he actually is. Um, it's all within uh, kind of measurement, measurement errors, reaction time differences, things like that. But it's uh, consistent with that uh, time frame for a speed of about um, 40, 45 miles an hour. And so um, that's what we have. The photo is documenting the, the parts of uh, lamp post uh, number two. Um, we find that the the mass is found laying to the left side of the flight path. It's bent, not severed, at 90 degrees. Uh, the height of the bent is about 25 feet, same as a light pole number one. The lamp and the upper support arm appear to be on the fog line uh, or the shoulder of Route 27. Uh, they landed near the base of lamp post number two, approximately under their original location, similar to what we saw in the uh, vehicle light pole uh, collision video that we saw uh, earlier in the presentation. The lower support arm is not visible, so there's one piece, one major piece that's missing, and we don't see it here. So what we see is the uh, mast of lamp post number two is visible from a distance here. Uh, here's a kind of a close-up of it. Lamp number two is not severed but bent. Uh, the location of the debris for lamp post number two is shown here. Uh, it's uh, on the fog lines and it's got the um, uh, upper arm only. The lower arm is missing. And the field of view for what you're looking at is shown on the right hand side. The problem mechanics of the destruction of light pole number one. Um, the problem mechanisms of the destruction of light pole number one are shown in this in the following slides. Um, upon impact at mid height, mid mast height, the mast is very quickly severed into three parts. Support arm and, and lamp have a uh, little horizontal acceleration due to inertia and fall near their original location. The middle five-foot segment suggests impact by a large mass, um, the large mass of a leading winning spar, possibly impacted by the right engine. So this is a probable sequence for the lamp post uh, disintegration. We have four figures here. The initial one is the, the leftmost, and we can see that we're assuming that the pole was impacted about 22 feet up. Uh, and then what, what I've done is I've shown a, a kind of a progression as to how things would have fallen where they would have fallen. Uh, the second one shows that the post is being severed at the 22 foot mark. The very top, because of the resistance of movement, uh, has been broken at the um, very top of the, the mass piece and the upper and lower arm are together. The lamp is separated and there's a five foot uh, piece that is kind of moving off to the right hand side going to end up in the travel lane and on the left travel lane on Washington Boulevard. The third one shows them uh, separating and beginning to fall and the w last one shows that the, the the large piece of the mass has just fallen over. The upper and lower arms have fallen down about where they had started off and as well as the the lamp and then the five foot um, uh, Mast piece number two uh, is continued on into the travel lane. It may have hit the jersey barriers on the other side and bounced back. Uh, we don't know. All we know is that the, that it ends up in that direction. Photos documenting the, the parts of lamp number one. Uh, the mast was severed into the three parts. The mast one, the large segment, the lower 25 feet or so, is in the right travel lane. Mast two is in the... Uh, left to travel lane, 
uh, mass part three is still connected to the upper lower support arms and is, it's initially seen on the travel uh, lane side of the fog line. Uh, upper and lower support arms are together. So here's mass parts uh, uh, one and two. The mass part uh, one is in the front, mass part two is in the back. The mass part three is near the fog line and we'll see that in another. This is the photo of Lloyd's taxi cab taken by uh, Jason Ingersoll. What we see here is that the lamp mass number one is laying on the ground. It's bent. The telephoto lens makes it look a little little bigger bend than there actually was. The Beyond that is the lamp. Beyond that is the upper and lower arms for the lamp post number one uh, attached to the very tip of the mast. The piece that is going to be seen in some of the other photos that is the lower support arm for lamp post number two which would have been pulled out of the windshield is not seen in here and is probably obscured by the, the hood of this white car and so we have the mast and we have the upper and lower support arms they're still connected um, together uh, and we can actually see the wires hanging out of the um, the the uh, support arms and this is kind of a close-up of that and this is a, a kind of another photo and it shows the location of uh, mass part two in the travel lane the lamp in the foreground the large mast piece to the right and to the left we see uh, uh, Highlighted in the with the yellow text is that the, this was obscured in the uh, Ingersoll photo and appears different than the upper and lower lamp support arms in the Ingersoll photos. It's consistent with the lower support arm of lamp post number two um, that would have been taken out of Lloyd's uh, taxi. So, what do we have for the observations? Um, the significant parts of lamp posts number one and two are accounted for in the photos, both lamp post mast. Uh, mast one is found in three parts. Mast uh, two is found in one piece, but bent at 90 degrees. Both upper support arms are accounted for. Uh, lower support arm for lamp one is seen. Uh, lower support arm for lamp post two was moved and most likely what was impaled in Lloyd's taxi. Analysis of the Sitco security cameras. We have our table of contents. If you want to jump to another section, feel free to. Go to the slide numbers shown on the right. And this is for chapters 9 through 17. There are four usable videos that were released related to the Pentagon on 9-11. Two Pentagon security gate cameras. These included the five famous uh, frames and a, a significant number of other frames too that we'll be talking about when we get to that section. Detailed analysis verifies their authenticity. Double, the double tree security cameras, there's probably three of them. Only one of them was uh, useful because it was pointed towards the, the Pentagon. Topography prevents discernible view of the plane approach and the impact, but it does show the fireball and not much else. And then, of course, we have the Sitco security camera, which we're going to be talking about in this section. This is an overview of the area around the Sitco uh, service station. The field of view for the security camera is to the south and the east. The direction of the sunlight is coming in from the east and at an angle of 38 degrees. Because of the angle of the sun and the location of the shadow, uh, we can estimate that the height of the plane was 75 feet above ground level. And so this, the Sitco shadow actually helps position the height of the, the plane and it fits in pretty well with the actual trajectories. I've highlighted also something called the location of the tree across the street. Uh, this is going to be used to help verify and validate the, some of the impediments that we're going to be seeing as the uh, shadow passes. This is an overhead 3D view of the Sitco service station. It shows the, uh, the 
flight path of the uh, approaching plane. And in the bottom right hand corner, we have an area that we're going to zoom into a little bit later and talk about it. You might notice that there's a tree uh, shadow in the very bottom right hand corner. Uh, that's going to be, that's the tree that's across the street that we talked about. The single pump side was the location of many camera crews on 9-11. Uh, what you see here on the right hand side is the compressed natural gas pumps uh, and the gasoline pumps are near the Sitco store and that's where the Sitco camera, security camera, actually is located. Camera crews really liked this area. It was very convenient to gather and they were allowed to spend their time here photog photographing and also uploading their images. The Sitco security video. The video consists of multiple windows within a single uh, frame. What we have here on the um, top right hand corner is this dual pump side. That's where Sergeant Lagasse, uh, who's got the white car that is seen at the pump, he's going to leave about 15 to 20 seconds after the shadow passes. And we can see the uh, shadow uh, which is passing on the left hand side as the uh, two dark bars, dark areas that are highlighted by the yellow. The lower two images are from the store. Uh, there's going to be some excitement uh, after the shadow appears um, as people start to come up against the windows uh, and to go outside. So there's a lot of activity just after the shadow goes. Not only does Sergeant Lassie leave, the people are all agitated and they do something. And then the other videos frames are for smaller areas uh, inside the store, storerooms, things like that. And so uh, I've highlighted where you're going to see the people gathering and rushing outside if you go watch the original videos. And again, I've got the shadow highlighted in the yellow oval. So kind of zooming into this particular area, we're going to kind of kind of zoom into this uh, in a couple of steps. There's a sales floor off to the right, and uh, you can see that there's a time and a date stamp, and the dates aren't right, and uh, the, ultimately you'll see that the times aren't, aren't very good. So let's take a look at the photos of the shadow. What we see here is uh, highlighted in the blue area, we've got the shadow that's visible. Uh, the security camera ti uh, time is 940, 35, and uh, 0.33 seconds. Sergeant Legassi, you can actually see him moving around at his car. Just in front of this, he's apparently talking to his dog, and I would, I can't, you can't really tell, but I would suspect that he's actually facing towards the, the store area and not away from it. If he was facing away from it, uh, he would not be able to see to th his left uh, because the pumps are so high. He wouldn't be able to see that. He'd only be able to see very, really straight through because of where he's located. So let's go to the next one. This is um, the photo without the shadow. We have the, the tree across the street highlighted in a, uh, in a dotted uh, hat, kind of, so to speak. And that's going to be useful in trying to verify that what is impacting the, or dividing the shadow are actually some trees, some shrubs. So the next one show is we have the tree across the street and we now have the shadows highlighted in the blue. Now if we go take a look at the image without the shadow, you can see that it's all kind of white. And then if we flip to it again, you can see the shadow once again. And again, it's split in half by, by something that is between the camera and the tree across the street. Vehicles traveling along the street are seen from frame to frame as they kind of go from, um, from the left to the right or the right to the left. They just kind of like chug along and you can see them from frame to frame. But there are certain areas where they can't be seen uh, due to other impediments. Uh, and we'll be talking about that uh, a little bit later. But these shadows just appear and then they're gone. There's, so there's nothing that approaches from the right or the left or departs from the right to the right or to the left. They just, these just happen to appear. So let's take a look at the visual impediments. If we take a look at the single pump side of the 
of the uh, Sitco station, uh, I've highlighted where the shrubs are that that are in the way. You can see I've drawn the line of sight for between the video camera, the security camera, and the tree that's across the street, which I've identified with the green hat again. So the trees are kind of in the way. I don't know for sure which ones are actually the impediments of just exactly how everything was uh, structured. There's not enough detail really to discern that, but you can certainly clearly see that there is a pair of shrubs between where the security camera would be and the tree across the street. Uh, on 9-11 there was a lot of camera crews as I mentioned and you can see the shrubs are uh, shown here. These aren't the, really the, the tall shrubs but they are some of the shrubs shrubbery that is there and probably has some impact on some of the other areas uh, of field of view. From a 2008 street view from Google Maps street view uh, I've uh, located myself with the tree across the street to my back and that's the right um, the bottom right hand corner that's the tree and if you look and turn towards the Sitco station this is what you would see so we've got the two grown-up shrubs uh, that are now between my location and by extension the tree across the streets location and the camera and so because of that now you can see why there would be some impediments why the shadow might not be uh, visible uh, for the entire length because we have one of these trees that are in the way and the saturation for the because it is a very high contrast you can't tell really what's there you just know that you can't see stuff moving along behind it so I'm going to do a little analysis here of the visual impediments. If you want to go get the original videos, you can do the same thing, of course. You can, uh, I've highlighted where South Joyce Street is. This is where you'll see cars going back and forth, back and forth. Um, I've identified the east and west sides. But as you watch cars going back and forth, there's several spots where they are never seen. They're never seen in the areas that are highlighted by the, by the blue. There's um, a lot of times you can see them in the far lane, but not the near lane. So uh, there's some things that are happening um, that are creating the, these gaps. So what I've done is I've highlighted the um, I've highlight, highlighted these areas where you can see the vehicles. That's within the hollow red uh, squares. The blue squares you can't see them, and we're going to show where the shadows are. And the shadows show up right here where the uh, dark ovals are. So that's the that seems to uh, confirm that this is these these are the areas where the trees were impediments, and that uh, that this is why you would see the shadows in those areas and not in other areas.